It's 9 a.m. live from the NASDAQ market site in New York City on this Monday morning. I'm Shauna Smith alongside Brad Smith, and this is Yahoo Finance Live. Here's your morning rundown. Well, we are one day away from Yahoo Finance's Invest Conference, where we are talking to the biggest players in the world of business, finance, politics, live from New York City. Names like Jeff Zucker, Jeffrey Gunlock, Noriel Rabini, and Meredith Whitney. We will be bringing big ideas and bold decisions to investors worldwide. It all starts 8.45 a.m. Eastern time tomorrow, only on Yahoo Finance, sponsored by Tasty Trade. And another week of corporate earnings as the market looks to extend its recent rally. Warren Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway reported over the weekend, ending the quarter with a record cash pile and widening losses, though, due to a weaker market. Notable names on the docket for this week include Disney, Uber, Rivian, and Warner Brothers. Economic data will be quieter, though there's plenty of Fed speak for markets to digest. Plus, big things happening at Tesla's Germany factory. Workers will get a 4% pay bump starting this month, per a report from the Wall Street Journal. Now, the Berlin site is also building a cheaper vehicle. That's a big reason why we're seeing some movement in the stock this morning. That's according to Reuters, with a reported price tag of 25,000 euros. The new vehicle would be roughly half the price of the average EV cost in Europe. Well, it is a big week for Yahoo Finance with our Invest Conference taking place all day tomorrow. The title of our event, Big Ideas, Bold Decisions. And together with our partner, Tasty Trade, we've got some huge names ready to discuss the most pressing issues in the investment landscape today. Our coverage kicks off with a couple of big hitters in Verizon CEO Hans Vestberg and Marriott CEO Anthony Capuano. And we've got influential household names in the shape of Dr. Doom, Noriel Rubini, and former Goldman Sachs chief investment strategist, Abby Joseph Cohen. The big names don't stop there with the bond market very much in focus. What better time to speak with Double Line CEO Jeffrey Gunlock? Plus one that I'm very much looking forward to, my conversation with former CNN president Jeff Zucker. Again, this all gets underway tomorrow, 8.40 at 5 a.m. Eastern time. And Brad, we just rattled off a number of top names within their respective industries, starting there with where I just ended, Jeff Zucker. And yeah. I think that conversation is going to be so interesting. He knows more about media, I think, than almost anyone out there right now. So getting his thoughts just on the current landscape in media, what the future holds, what the value should or should not look like surrounding names like CNN, when you talk about some of the other cable networks uh, potentially here that are up for sale following Bob Iger's comments when it comes to ABC, ESPN, whether or not they would ever be of interest here to investors and whether he specifically would be interested in something like a CNN. And then you talk about more broadly speaking, some of the uncertainty out there for investors, this rising risk of recession. We're going to be hearing from some of the biggest names out there right now just in terms of what they're doing to navigate this very uncertain time and what they see ahead for 2024. Yeah, you saw Ed Norton as well in that bottom corner of that <laughs> graphic too. Uh, of course, perhaps not so much market commentary there. He still upsets me for his role in the Italian job. But at the end of the day, that's going to be a great conversation that our viewers are going to be able to take in. But you hit the nail on the head with the confluencer, the crossroads of themes and at this intersection right now where the geopolitical tension as well has really moved to the top of many CEOs watch list one of the larger uncertainties that they're seeing how that plays out and where policy is also going to be set forth in international business as well being impacted by that so that's going to be interesting to see how that's acknowledged in more than one conversation and I think Dr. Doom Noriel Rubini uh, and of course that's just his kind of uh, side name that he's been given but all that considered He's had some some predictions in the past here uh, that really could catch some attention, get headlines tomorrow, especially considering the fact that with the kind of congruence of, of some of these events taking place, as well as where the Fed policies move forward from here, I think that's exactly where the CEOs are going to be. And a lot of our commentary is going to be kind of placing the emphasis tomorrow in just while these challenges continue to be front and centers, where are there still pockets of opportunity, but where do investors need to be savvy, need to be smart as well? And we're going to help investors with those decisions tomorrow. Yeah, and on the PE side of things, I'll also be speaking with uh, Scott Sperling. He's the co-CEO of THL Partners, just getting his take right now 
on the current economic landscape, investment landscape, and where yeah. he's seeing some investment opportunities here in the year ahead. All right, well, Friday's jobs report is showing an uptick in unemployment for the month of October. It was seen by economists as a better signal for the overall employment market than a strike impacted headline number. The big picture for investors now with higher for longer rates on the table, some may be looking to a different corner of the market, small caps. The Russell 2000 is up nearly 2% in the last month. Our next guest saying that small cap balance sheets could be in better shape than investors feared and tend to price in economic problems ahead of time. We want to bring in Lori Calvacina, RBC Capital Markets, head of U.S. equity strategy, joining us now. Lori, it's great to see you. So let's step back just a bit here. You're seeing some opportunity in small caps. What's the investment thesis there? Why do they look attractive at a time like right now? So, well, thanks for having me as always. And I think you start out with the valuations. If you look at Russell 2000 valuations against S&P 500 PEs, we're basically at the lowest level we've seen since the kind of 99, 2003 type era, so the tech bubble era. And that's causing some multi-asset investors to take notice. The other thing about small caps is that you typically want to buy them midway through a recession. They tend to lag late in an economic cycle. And so there's really a sense that when times get dicey economically, that's when you want to go bargain hunting in the small cap space in particular. Now, I will tell you my conversations with investors, all of it the last couple months has really focused on balance sheets. And so we've been spending a lot of time walking investors through how just like the large cap companies, small cap companies have really paid down their shorter term and variable rate debt. They still have more of it than the big cap companies, but just like the large cap companies, they've really pivoted towards long term debt that they've locked in at very, very low rates. So they're benefiting from the era of low interest rates a bit longer than many investors have realized. And so we think the balance sheet bite really isn't as bad as feared for these companies right now. Laurie, in your notes to us, you say that growth sectors are typically the biggest beneficiaries of declining 10-year Treasury yields. I wonder, though, you know, if we do see some type of kind of uh, step off of, of the gas or if a surge in yield stops soon, then what? So we actually went and looked at the history. And if you look at in the past in both rising rate cycles and falling rate cycles. Uh, so we went all the way back to the 60s, frankly. We found that the equity market can weather increases in the 10-year Treasury yield up to about 275 basis points. And at the peak that we'd seen earlier, or I guess last month now in October, that was really kind of in the 160s. I forget the exact number, but it really wasn't anywhere close to that level that tends to produce declines in the equity market. Now, the surge in yields that we saw in 2021-2022, that was over 300 basis points. So that is in line with the kind of move Moves that we tend to see. We've seen historically that if your move in Treasury yields is more than 275 basis points, that's when stocks tend to fall. So I think that if the equity markets really get convinced that we've seen the peak in yields, and I will tell you based on the conversations I had with investors last week, a lot of people are hoping that that's the case then I think equity markets, you know, it's a good chance we've put in the bottom. Um, if it if that rise resumes, then we're going to be in trouble. But if we top out around 5%, the history says equity markets can handle this. And given the weight of the big cap growth stocks, um, that should augur pretty well for them as well. Laura, you just mentioned there some of the chatter out there right now about yields. Do you think we've seen a peak in yields? I'm an equity strategist, not an interest rate strategist. I will tell you that the rates community, I think, didn't necessarily have a great handle on why we had seen that yield surge that happened and why it happened as quickly as it did. Um, if you look at the consensus forecasts around the street, uh, they are still looking at the end of this year, at the end of next year, for yields to move lower. Now, we have seen a really strong ratcheting up of year-end 2023 forecasts on the 10-year. It was around 3.5% uh, over the summer and, frankly, for much of 2023. And now, if you look at that expectation, um, it's around 4.5%. So I would say the people who are smarter than me on this issue have recalibrated their forecasts but seem to be settling into the idea that they'll move a little bit lower from the peaks that we've seen recently. What, what is the top equity market idea? You know, you mentioned small caps earlier, but if you're kind of going bargain hunting or maybe on the other side of that, maybe you're looking across some of the valuations that you're expecting to, to come down, especially given the fact that the Magnificent Seven have driven so much of the, the equity market surge in the S&P 500, at least over the course of this year. Is there a reset that we're due for at some point? So I, 
I think that the growth trade, it's just in a really, really strange spot right now. If you look at growth stocks mm. relative to value stocks, they've been overvalued. If you look at a market cap weighted multiple, CFTC data suggests that the growth trade is still very crowded. On the other hand, growth stocks tend to outperform when the economy is sluggish. And consensus forecasts on the economic side are calling for, I think, about 1% GDP growth next year and 1.8% in 2025. And the long-term run rate is about 2%. So economists expect that we're heading into this sluggish economy, and typically growth stocks outperform in that environment. So they're kind of these near-term tactical problems that have to be resolved. But at the same time, that longer-term fundamental appeal for the growth talk is very, very strong. My way of approaching this is to have a bit of a barbell approach. Some people have called it a tribell approach. I want a little bit of defense. I like health care for that. On the value side, I like energy. But on the growth side, I will tell you, I'm still recommending the technology sector. And one of the things that caught my eye last week is that if you look at a median PE for the S&P 500 tech sector, which doesn't reflect the Magnificent Seven, but really reflects what's going on elsewhere in the sector, you're basically back down to the average on both an absolute and relative PE multiple. So I think value has been unlocked in the tech sector, even if those bigger cap, mega cap names in the tech space still have some problems. Lori, how much has the sentiment, do you think, shifted already here in the month of November? We're only six days in, but certainly we are seeing more of a bullish type of outlook here between now and the end of the year. Is that something that you see sticking here for the next several weeks? So, you know, I'm a little bit of a data nerd, and I will tell you, we had something really exciting happen on one of our models last week that we've been waiting to happen for a while, which is that if you look at the AAII net bull bear ratio, just net bullishness, so the bulls less the bears, it went down to two standard deviations below the long-term average last week on the weekly data point. And we look, tend to look at a four-week average because there's a lot of noise in that, and that four-week average went down to about 9% in favor of the bears, and that's about a one standard deviation move below the long-term average. And tip Typically, when you're at one standard deviation below the average on that four-week average, stock market's up about 14% over the next 12 months. Does that mean that we've necessarily put in the lows that we're completely out of the woods? No, we do often see that four-week average go to the two standard deviation mark as it did last year around the October lows. But this is certainly something that as I look into next year, makes me feel a lot better about the longer term path for equities. And then when you think about some of the other indicators that you're going to be tracking going forward from here, I mean, some of the high frequency indicators that you've also been keeping tabs on, what should investors kind of be keen to there? I mean, there's so much that we can watch. I would say that I'm also looking at the CFTC data very, very closely, you know, kind of going back to our small cap conversation earlier. Um, the net positioning among asset managers for Russell 2000 futures has been down around SVB lows. It has not hit recession type lows that we saw in 2022, but certainly we got to an interesting, you know, sort of level there as well. So we'll be watching that to see if it breaks and if it does break if, when, when it gets to that 2022 levels. But if it starts to heal, you know, I think it deserves that move. I think the other thing, you know, I really would like this valuation froth and crowding to get out of the Magnificent Seven, to get out of that kind of broader growth space. And so we're watching the CFTC data on NASDAQ 100 minis futures positioning, again, among the asset managers. And that, you know, frankly, it's caused trouble uh, for the broader market a few times in recent years. It's kind of hit the recent highs that we saw last August as well. It's been very slow to roll over. So I would really like to see that one just collapse, frankly, so we can kind of get this crowding argument done and over with. <laughs> yeah. Lori Calvacina, RBC Capital Markets Head of U.S. Equity Strategy. Lori, great to begin the week here with you. We appreciate the time and insights. Thanks. We're right, also thanks watching shares me. of Tesla. Absolutely. We're also watching shares of Tesla today popping in pre-market trading as we are getting reports out of its operations in Germany. According to a Reuters report, the EV maker is working on a more affordable vehicle in its Berlin factory that would cost about 25,000 euro, which is well below the average price of an EV in Europe, which Auto's research from Jeto Dynamics uh, has found to be over 65,000 euros in the first half of 2023 here. Um, you think about where the pricing strategy has has continued to either come into question or just be more made known at Tesla, especially given around the world where they're looking at different regions and figuring out exactly at what price point they're not only able to perhaps catch the eye or catch the, catch the mind share of potential buyers out there, um, but then also at the same time where they can 
set the base price so that they can also see some sort of upgrade because the packages as well that they're laying on on top, that's where some of those margins really come into play. Yeah, exactly. And I think obviously getting a uh, more affordable EV is huge. When we talk about yeah. EV mass adoption, what exactly is needed to really get those numbers significantly higher from where they are today? Many analysts that we have talked to and even uh, auto executives here over the last several months, going back several years, they talk about the fact that they need to make EVs a bit more affordable in order to uh, really increase adoption numbers. So you take into account this potential price tag, if this report is correct here about Tesla developing a cheaper EV, would equate to just about $27,000 here in U.S. dollars. That's considerably cheaper than what is on the market right now from Tesla. Taking a look at the Model 3 right now, and that starts just around, just below $39,000. So obviously many of their cars, and that's the lowest end of their cars, right? So many of them are much more expensive. People certainly cannot afforded in this environment right now. And also coupling that with the higher rate environment obviously makes uh, more expensive cars less affordable to more and more people. When you talk about exactly what needs to happen to get to the, that mass adoption, we know Tesla has time and time again laid out the fact that they are aiming to increase vehicle deliveries to 20 million by 2030. Yeah. They need a cheaper vehicle, you would think, Absolutely. in order for that number to be attainable. So if this, in fact, is true, they are building a cheaper EV. This could be a huge opportunity for Tesla, and then we'll also see what that means for some of their competitors out there, too. And this particular factory, this gigafactory, Berlin Brandenburg particularly, it is known for making the Model Y. However, you think about the overlap and the synergies that they have in production between the mass market Model 3 mm -hmm. and the Model Y. 75% of the Model Y is actually the Model 3. And so all of that considered, that production kind of manufacturing uh, ability and the overlaps there, perhaps that gives them a little bit more of that ability to crank out more vehicles within this uh, Berlin Gigafactory as well over the future, too, to hit some of those goals you mentioned. All right, well, we got the opening bell fast approaching just about 15 minutes from now. Let's see what stocks are doing here in pre-market trading. Also keeping a check on oil and the 10-year yield. Jared Blickery, what do you got? Yes, we are moving a little bit higher in the 10-year, six basis points, but that's after a precipitous decline last week that really allowed growth stocks and basically everything, especially fringe stocks, to really get a nice pop. And let's take a look at some of the early action today. Uh, broadly speaking, we are ahead in most sectors. Energy is the number one. You can see that was down Friday by 1.01%, but it is up 84 basis points in the pre-market. And on that note, uh, let's take a look, a quick look at crude oil here. Crude oil is up 1.64 percent. The news coming from OPEC Plus is that Saudi Arabia and Russia are going to stand pat and they are going to keep withholding 1.3 million barrels of oil per day. That was largely expected, but still maybe uh, got a, a little pop there anyway. But I just want to show what's happened over the last three years. In proportion to what happened with the Russian invasion of Ukraine, we really didn't get that much of a pop. Um, didn't go up to the 130 level, which is what we saw last year. And in fact, it looks like the rally in oil has kind of sizzled out. And I'm seeing calls for oil's return, at least WTI, to the 70s. The current price is 81.83. But nevertheless, on that pop, we are seeing energy stocks jumping right now. We have financial stocks also up about one third of a percent. Staples, tech, healthcare, so kind of a broad swath that we're looking at. Now, there are some underperformance here. If you take a look, gambling, uh, bets was up 5.15% last Friday, but it's down 2.5%. Software and chip stocks taking a little bit of a hit. But check out EWY. That is a Korean uh, stock market ETF. They banned short selling over the weekend, and that's something that has goosed the stock market before. Why am I watching Korea? It is an important bellwether for the entire global tech trade. So it's interesting that Korea is up, but in the U.S., tech is largely underwater. So it might just say that the short selling ban and not the underlying fundamentals have to do with that pop. Now, here's looking at the chip sector. NVIDIA, by the way, up six tenths of a percent, seeing a little bit of negative action in ASML and Broadcom. Let's take a look at software, which I also noted was uh, weak, at least in the ETF, but a lot of these names actually flashing quite a bit of green. So let's move on. We'll take a look at the energy sector. That was number one. Now, all that red in the background, that is from last week, that is from Friday. But this morning, we have uh, Total jumping about 1.44%, Shell up 1.5%, and then Chevron and Exxon each up 
about three quarters of one percent, guys. All right, Jared, stay with us for the opening bell. We've got much more to discuss in just a few minutes here. Everyone, we're going to go to a quick break. We've got all your markets action ahead live from the NASDAQ market site to kick off this trading day and trading week. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance. 2023 rocked the markets. NVIDIA, the stock has been on a tear. Silicon this Valley Bank's collapse is the second largest bank failure in the U.S. Inflation, mortgage rates, a diabetes drug, exempting. Now it's time to make bold decisions. Yahoo Finance Invest, the marquee event for investors seeking big ideas and bold decisions. Guided by the newsroom you trust. Don't miss it. November 7th, exclusively on Yahoo Finance. I'd do it with her, honestly. Warren Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway posted its first quarterly loss in a year, but the company did see a 40% jump in operating earnings as it sets on a, uh, sits on a record $157.2 billion in cash. The Oracle of Omaha's company reported an investment loss of $24.1 billion in the third quarter, led by its big stake in Apple here. Okay, so if you were taking a look at these results over the weekend, you would be guided to one of the most cut-and-dry, minimalist investor relations pages you have ever seen in your life for Berkshire Hathaway, but all in, there's some great nuggets in there. First and foremost, when you think about B Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger and, and this company and the number of holdings uh, that they have as well here, this 
has been an interesting year for how they navigate the stock market. And, and remember, Berkshire Hathaway and Warren Buffett, he's the first to admit that he is not the most, he didn't jump at some of the biggest tech trades that they've made. Now, look at their position in Apple. And so all of that considered, you've been looking across some of those names that have been able to kind of find themselves within that magnificent seven where, sure, Buffett has some of those holdings, but at the same time, if we did and continued to see over the past few months at this point, that slippage in the stock market, that's directly going to be impacting where their own, not just cash pile moves towards, but where ultimately some of those equity investments lose some of the value as well. Yeah, exactly. And I think the big takeaway, at least for me from this report, was that record cash amount that they had, $157 billion, really shows two things. One, obviously, how Berkshire is positioned amongst many of its rivals. But two, just the fact that Simply put, there's not a lot of attractive uh, opportunities out there, at yeah. least in terms of what Warren Buffett and his team are seeing. So when you take into account, I guess, how Berkshire is positioned among some of those rivals, they should, you would think, be able to better uh, weather some of the uh, challenging times ahead, given the fact that their company is so diverse. They have many diverse uh, revenue streams here, so that would be able to buoy it maybe a little bit better than some of its other competitors out there. But when you take a look at some of the analyst reaction to this, CFRA's analyst Kathy Seifert saying that the firm's margins, they were bolstered, bolstered by a turnaround in insurance underwriting profitability, particularly at Geico. She talked about the pullback in writings and ad spending, which helped drive that return to profitability. And then going forward, talking about improving margins, the top, the strong top line growth, that's going to potentially be a catalyst here for shares going forward. We're seeing some of that play out. But like many investors, when they look at earnings reports from Berkshire Hathaway. They obviously want to see them as we look ahead to the annual meeting as well. They obviously want to know what Warren Buffett thinks of the current environment right now, where yeah. he's seeing opportunity. And when you talk about diversifying your portfolio, what he sees as attractively valued right now in terms of what that could then look like three to five, ten years from now. We just had on Brooks Running, owned by Berkshire Hathaway mm -hmm. last week, the CEO, Jim Weber, told us that Warren Buffett has his own sneaker. He's got his own Brooks Running shoe. I didn't know that. I did not know that either. Yeah, yeah. I gotta get did my hands on Did you see a picture of it? I didn't see a picture. I should have asked for a photo. So you're a sneakerhead. So Pixar doesn't I was going to ask you if you would be in the market for that. I, why not? Yeah, 100%. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, speaking of what's on your feet, Wall Street feeling bullish on Birkenstock here today. Let's talk a little bit about this one. Company just went public recently. Several analysts now, including ones from Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, Baird, Citi, they're all initiating coverage of the retailer with a buy equivalent rating following the company's public debut. Birkenstock shares are down over 10% since its IPO. It's not a sprint, it's a marathon, especially when you're wearing Birkenstocks. Ultimately, as of right now, though, you're seeing them over that course in time, uh, seeing some slippage, uh, at least in this early kind of moment as a publicly traded entity. Yeah, certainly. I mean, I think my takeaway from this is the street is pretty much mixed on exactly how Birkenstock is posi positioned right now. There yeah. certainly are a number of outperform buy ratings on the stock. You can see 11 right there. On your screen, Citigroup among the mo most bullish with the price target 52 bucks a share. That's a jump of about 26% from current levels. Jeffrey's not too far behind with a price target of 50 bucks. But you do have six analysts out there with a hold rating. You talk about the fact of why they're staying on the sidelines right now. Some of the reasons why we're that they're at least a bit apprehensive. Bank of America is one of those companies with a neutral rating saying that while we view it as a strong brand with unique attributes, we think outsized growth on the top of the robust recent trends is going to be difficult. You talk about the fact that the consumer might be weakening just a bit. We certainly have seen a shift or a pullback, I should say, in consumer spending. How exposed a company like Birkenstock is, is something that is up for debate right now because many of the bulls out there that do have that buy or, or outperform a rating on the stock right now saying that they have a very loyal customer base and they're going to be able to weather yeah. this uncertain time better than some of the rivals. But you got to take into account that consumers are being a little bit more uh, cautious in terms of spending right now and pulling back on some of their purchases. It's an expensive clog. It, it's not cheap. It is comfortable, but at the end of the day, I think for what Goldman Sachs is looking at here too, and what they had said, they're looking at the compound annual growth rate, expecting that to be between this year and calendar year 2026 to be about 18% in that in that CAGR, compound annual growth rate there. Um, and then so additionally, just saying at this point at least, shares look attractive on a growth adjusted metric basis. So um, whether you're buying the clogs, whether you're buying the, the sandal, uh, I mean, I've tried them on, they're, they're pretty good. Um, yeah. they, are, they are very comfy. I actually don't own a pair, but I know a lot of people who are very loyal customers and they come yeah. back 
buying more and more. And I also think one of the questions here from analysts is what that growth trajectory looks like in terms of more products potentially exactly. here in the future. If they're able to further diversify outside of the clogs, which they are so well known for, obviously. You talk about the fact that they could potentially expand into orthopedics, professional, outdoor, active, kids, home, sneakers. The options are endless. It's just whether or not they do follow that route and expand their product line and then what that could in turn do to their customer base. They make huge. They make boots. They do make boots. They, I wonder how comfortable they are though. I mean, it looks like they've got some good lining in them. I don't know. I don't know if it's Sherpa lining, but it's it's good lining in those boots. So. It is good lining. I know. And people that people that wear Birkenstocks, they swear by them up and down, saying that they are so comfortable. I got the rubber ones. And they're good yeah. for your cats too. They are. They are good for your cats. All right. Well, there is the opening bell on Wall Street as we kick off another trading week here. We got Jared Blickery standing by for a closer look at some of the movement that we're seeing right at the open, Jerry. Yes, we're seeing uh, more red, more green than red, excuse me. Real estate, that's taking a little bit of a hit, but down less than uh, uh, about one quarter of 1%. Materials, industrials also flirting with the unchanged or the unch, as they call it. But energy, still the number one uh, gainer here. That's up half a percent. Uh, that's on the back of OPEC Plus, renewing its commitment to keep out 1.3 million barrels of oil per day. Then we have healthcare consumer discretionary, which is retail financials, all of those outperforming on the top row, plus utilities, looks like it's also a factor in there as well. As I was saying before the bell as well, uh, Korean stocks, EWI, that is up the most, that's up 6%. And if you take a look over the last seven days, that's also the number one. So that includes uh, last week and one day from uh, the week prior. Home builders, those are taking up a little bit of space in the red here. High yield and liquid, so bonds really not uh, doing it for investors today, but everything else in the green. And that has been kind of the rally that we saw last week that was kicked off by the Federal Reserve and also continued on the back of that somewhat benign headline in, uh, payroll number that we got on Friday. Let's take out, uh, take a look at a fringe part of the market here. This is meme stocks. Looks like Coinbase in the lower left, that's up 2.4%, Siri up 3.5%. I was just looking at our crypto page and Ripple is uh, uh, ripping higher, I guess. Uh, that's a good one. All right. Uh, it's up 115% year to date, but look, look at what's happened over the last month. Now, this comes after the SEC has backed off of them from a regulatory. Uh, they had them in court, uh, so they had them on the ropes for a while. Now they've backed off, and also uh, the company, I believe they got regulatory approval in Dubai, so that could be contributing, but impressive gains there over the last month. Compare that to Bitcoin. Also impressive, up about 25% and holding that $35,000, $36,000 level. Now, I was looking at a little bit of weakness uh, before the bell in software, and we're seeing some red squares here, but nothing that really, uh, out, that, nothing outstanding. And let me put the sem semiconductors up here. There we go. Uh, kind of a similar screen, got some green, got some red. NVIDIA up 1.2%. Uh, let's just take a quick look at year to date. Uh, recently bounced off the lower end of a trading range, but it has held that trading range pretty tightly. And uh, that high right there, that was on an earnings announcement date. And we're going to get another one of those in a couple of weeks. And we'll see if it can finally punch higher. It's still one of the huge leaders for the year. You can see they're up 200%. Uh, we took a look at energy before. Let's take a look at banking stocks and more green than red here. Bank America up 1%. Uh, HSBC up about one and a half percent and just checking in on some of the regional banks here real quick because those had been uh, some of the biggest sufferers and taking more of a hit. It looks like today they are not. Key Bank, uh, that's up 1.36%. And for the most part, uh, I think today is looking like it kind of wants to be risk on and we'll see what happens into the close, guys. We will, and we'll be keeping a close eye on that. All right, Jared, thanks so much. Let's take a look at another big mover today. A leadership shakeup is coming to Bumble, and we're seeing that reaction play out in the stock with shares off nearly 9%. Now, the company's founder and CEO, Whitney Wolf Hurd, will be stepping down from the helm. This is effective January 2nd, and will be replaced by current Slack CEO, Lydian Jones. Now, with Wolf Hurd remaining in the executive chair position, you talk about what, how significant this is to the company. We know Bumble has been very successful in terms of separating, differentiating itself from the other dating apps that are out there. They certainly have been welcomed here by investors. When you take into account that Wolf Hurd founded Bumble nearly a decade ago, she will remain on as executive chair, so that should help alleviate some of the fears out there from investors. But Whitney Wolf Hurd saying in this statement that she believes Bumble is 
significant potential more than ever before we take into account where it is positioned today. I thought hard about what type of leader could ultimately step into the CEO role as a successor and help continue taking Bumble to even greater heights. I am so pleased to have found Lydia. So when you take Bumble shares have been down about 45% over the past year, Lidini was the CEO of Slack, owned by uh, Salesforce, yeah. and just uh, took up that position not too long ago. So a bit of a surprise move here in terms of her already leaving Slack. And then, of course, the question is what this means for the company as they put it, the company's next chapter of growth here for Bumble. Yeah, absolutely. And that growth is going to come on a few major metrics here. You, you think about the average revenue per active user or paying user that is on the site right now that sits at about, what, 2.4 million, I believe, or excuse me, uh, 2.4 um, billion is what they brought in in the most recent um, excuse me, 2.4 million, where they're seeing ultimately over the past kind of three months, and this is basically just coming ahead of their earnings report. Their earnings report comes out tomorrow, so we're actually going to get an update on all these figures anyway. But looking across some of the total paying users and the growth that they've seen there, uh, that's sitting at about 3.6 million over this most recent quarter that ended in June uh, 2023. So all of that considered for, for Lydiani and the, and the kind of metrics that they're going to continue to watch with the strategic priorities they've set forth as well. It's still going to come in an era of, of strong financial discipline here, too. They've been talking about that. The CFO, Anu Subramanian, ha has kind of pounded the pavement on that. And so it'll be interesting to see where that strategic uh, play continues to come forward in this changeover. And so we'll hear more from the company tomorrow. We don't got to wait long. Also, from dating to Disney, let's talk about this one. The media giant has also announced a shakeup in its C-suite. PepsiCo CFO Hugh Johnston and friend of Yahoo Finance taking over of this, as the CFO and senior executive vice president at Disney, effective December 4th. CEO Bob Iger said in a statement, his expertise will serve Disney and its shareholders well as we continue to do the transformative work that we are doing to drive growth and value creation. So this, no doubt, a huge move here um, going from the food and beverage space over to the parks, streaming, and merchandise space with Disney. Yeah, we got to see how uh, Hugh Johnson's going to, I guess, take his 34 years that he spent with Disney, how that carries over into, Di or, sorry, 34 years he spent with Pepsi, how yeah, that yeah. carries over into his new career here at Disney. The fact that he's leaving Pepsi after a three decade uh, long career, more than three decades, certainly just a bit surprising here. We spoke to him just a few months ago about yeah. some of the trends that he's seeing from consumers, from their buying power, obviously insight that is going to be helpful when Disney figures out the path forward for their company uh, right now under Bob Iger. We know Iger has announced a number of strategic moves here since retaking the CEO job uh, just last year. So we'll see what exactly this all means for Pepsi, at least. They're saying that James Caulfield, who currently serves as the finance chief for PepsiCo Foods Business in the North American division, he's going to be named executive vice president and chief financial officer. So Johnston, from PepsiCo, moving on over to Disney. Yeah, this is a transformative time that he's yeah. stepping into over at Disney. And, and you mentioned some of the strategic moves. Uh, two things come to mind here for what Bob Iger and this company and the executive team now need to show to both investors, but some of the largest investors yeah. and the institutional investors, considering the activist campaigns that have come forward and some of them seeking board seats in those campaigns. This is a critical announcement and perhaps signals how much they're trying to show that they've got steady hands at the wheel over at Disney, uh, especially with someone who's got such a storied history as a chief financial officer as Hugh Johnston for another household name in PepsiCo. All that considered, too, Disney is still what, at not just the lows that we've seen over the course of this year, but multi-year lows in its, its share value. So um, there is a lot that needs to be evaluated, and it'll be interesting to see where Hugh Johnston kind of sets his kind of first 90-day priorities, especially given the fact that you've got an entity in ESPN that the executive team has already talked about. What do we do with this? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I'm facing activist, inve uh, uh, activist investor pressure here once again from Nelson Pelt. So hopefully we'll hear a little bit more about all this on the earnings that Disney has coming up later this week. All right, we'll keep right here on Yahoo Finance. We've got all your market action ahead live from the NASDAQ market site. We'll be right back. 2023 rocked the markets. NVIDIA, the stock has been on a tear. Silicon this Valley Bank's collapse is the second largest bank failure in the U.S. Inflation. Mortgage rates. It's a diabetes drug. Exempting. Now it's time 
to make bold decisions. Yahoo Finance Invest, the marquee event for investors seeking big ideas and bold decisions. Guided by the newsroom you trust. Don't miss it, November 7th, exclusively on Yahoo Finance. Insurance tech company Lemonade out with earnings results recently. While well, gross profit jumped 170% in its third quarter to $22 million, and its net loss narrowed by 33% to $62 million. Now, the company made its public debut just over three years ago as the market started to pick up again from the COVID 19 induced lulls. Now, the year was packed with other tech unicorns offering like Snowflake, Airbnb, DoorDash and Palantir. The company's IPO price was 29 bucks a share. Investors did pile in, pushing the stock to over $120 a share by the year end. But looking at shares today, they're trading just above 17, right around 17 bucks a share. That's thanks to a recent 40% surge that we saw following last week's third quarter results. Well, Lemonade, like many tech unicorns that debuted in the last few years, is struggling to achieve profitability, but its most recent results reveal that we could actually, or they could be closer to that goal. We want to bring in Lemonade CEO, Daniel Schreiber, joining us now. Daniel, it's great to have you here. Congratulations on what looks, looks to be an extremely strong quarter here from your company. You also raised your revenue guidance for the full year. Talk to us a little bit about some of the trends that you're seeing within your business and how you see that taking a Lemonade, not only in this current quarter, but shaping the business here as we look ahead to 2024. 
Well, good morning. Great to be with you. So indeed, the quarter was very strong. Um, we saw 55% growth in revenue, as you mentioned, 170% growth in gross profit. And other metrics like losses and loss ratio and operating expenses all down. So we are seeing the machine doing what we had hoped it would do. Um, we've guided up for the quarter, but we've also said that we think next year will be better yet, and that in 2025, we will achieve cash flow positivity with hundreds of millions of dollars of unencumbered cash in the bank. So this is really a story about the story about the whole thesis coming together, the technology doing what it had always promised, lowering expense ratios, lowering loss ratios, driving efficiency while delighting customers. Daniel, I wonder, and I'm specifically looking through where the revenue is coming in from and, and where there's been an increase. Premiums are, are one area that would catch a lot of investors' attention here. And as we think about kind of the different products that you do offer, for many who perhaps have their home insured, when you have a hot summer like we just came off of or more volatile weather, those premiums tend to go up. How, how have you needed to adjust premiums um, and, and where have you seen some of the customers either kind of realize that premium adjustment or others move away or, or say that's too high? Well, the whole industry has suffered greatly from heightened inflation. So the in industry at large, the economy has suffered from inflation, but homes have suffered disproportionately and cars even more so. So that loss ratios for insurers across the industry have been very, very high, particularly in those areas. And you've seen some of the largest, most marquee names in the nation withdrawing from some of its largest markets, California, Florida, and others. So this is a time of real stress throughout the insurance space. But we are seeing everything, at least within our own business, trending in the right direction. The graphic that you just showed shows rates slowly climbing while inflation is slowly declining. And one of the things we just shared last week is we're passing our two millionth customer any day now. And when you compare our millionth customer to our second millionth customer, you see that we have grown at a 35% faster rate. And even though customers have doubled in number, a gross earned profit has more than trebled in number. So we're seeing premiums for every customer growing much faster than the rest of the industry and naturally driving a lot of the efficiencies that we discussed. So today we offer car insurance, home insurance, renters insurance, life insurance, pet insurance, and all of them combined across not only the US but Europe are performing very strongly. Daniel, you just mentioned that uh, customer growth right there, 12% increase on a year-over-year -year basis. When you talk about the fact that you're just below 1.98 million, just below 2 million customers, what does that growth then look like? And is that growth at 12% on a year-over-year basis, is that sustainable? We actually indicated that we expect to accelerate growth in 2024 because of the inflationary pressures that I uh, intimated earlier. Mm. We've seen Lemonade and the industry suffer excessive loss ratios, which really means that rates have not kept pace with inflation and in a highly regulatory environment, there is going to be that kind of time lag. Looking forward, we're seeing that come down. The lag is closing. Um, and our rates are coming online. Just last week, California approved a 51% increase in our car or auto insurance rates in the state, and about 50% of our business is in that state. So these are very important milestones for our business. And as we see rate match risk, we are getting more confident about accelerating growth. And we've indicated that while we've grown this quarter and our guidance for next quarter is around the 17 or 18% growth, we think it will be considerably um, faster than that, accelerating growth in 2024. Indeed, a business like ours needs scale to get to profitability. Everything that we do is technology-based. We pay claims in as little as three seconds. We sell 98% of our policies through an AI chatbot. All of those investments in technology are great when you have a scale. They're not so great when you're small. Indeed, over the last 24 months, we've doubled our gross earned premium without growing our expenses. And that scalability is the secret of how we get to cash flow positivity in 24 months. Daniel, I want to ask you about the rising geopolitical conflict and how you're personally looking at this. I know it's a subject that you have been very vocal about. It came up a number of times on your earnings call. Just how are you navigating this conflict as CEO of Lemony, given the presence that your company has in Israel, obviously with that priority being safety first here for your employees, but what that also means for Lemonade's business as you think of the risk here of what that conflict could escalate and could look like here in months to come. 
the, the conflict in Israel, the Gaza war, is um, terribly distressing any which way you look at it. And the massacres on October 7th loom large. Friends, close friends of mine lost loved ones or have loved ones now as hostages in Gaza. It's hard to remove the atrocities from one's mind. But the ray of sunshine, if you like, is lemonade because the business has been incredibly resilient. The results that we discuss in the continued projections are notwithstanding that. 75% of our staff are outside of Israel. The overwhelming majority of our work at this point is done by AIs. So as I say, 98% of our policies are sold through AIs. 98% um, of our claims are first taken through AIs. So we have a very resilient organization with massive contingency plans for geopolitical unrest. So the one area that I am not concerned about is lemonade. Many concerns at a geopolitical level, but not at a company level. Daniel, we, we appreciate you d discussing a range of topics with us, but especially uh, considering the closeness of this to you and your team as well. Uh, thanks so much for taking some time here with us this morning. Daniel Schreiber, Lemonade CEO. Thank you both. Thanks. Absolutely. All your markets action ahead live from the NASDAQ market site. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance. We're live from the NASDAQ market site, and we are also one year away from the 2024 election. President Biden is in Delaware announcing more than $16 billion in funding for rail projects. The money, well, it comes from Biden's $1 trillion infrastructure law enacted nearly two years ago. It's one of the key legislative achievements the president is touting as he gears up for his reelection bid. But with a year to go until Election Day, a new string of polls are painting a grim picture for Joe Biden. Joining us now to break it down further is Yahoo Finance's Rick Newman. Hey, Rick. Uh, hey, Brad. Uh, so the biggest news over the weekend was this poll by the New York Times. They polled voters in six swing states. And keep in mind, it is going to be this small number of swing states that will decide the 2024 election, much as they did in 2020. And in five of those states, they found uh, voters saying they prefer Trump over Biden. So the states are uh, Georgia, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, Arizona, and Nevada. 
And only in Wisconsin did Biden have a lead over Trump by uh, two percentage points. In the other five states, uh, they found Trump winning. So Democrats are distraught over this. Uh, the Wall Street Journal uh, this morning called this a five alarm fire for Biden's reelection campaign. But everybody uh, who thinks this is a terrible sign for Biden needs to settle down a little bit. Yes, um, he's, in, he's in trouble on views of his handling of the economy. Uh, the world is an unstable place. We got a, a Middle East war to deal with. But we are also are a full year away from the 2024 election. Uh, a lot can change. And uh, let's just remember, President Trump faces 91 criminal counts in four separate cases. And some of those uh, trials are going to get underway next year. Uh, and one finding from this poll was a significant number of voters said, well, uh, they do support Trump now, but if he were convicted of a crime or he went to prison, nah, maybe they wouldn't they wouldn't vote for him after all. So there is a lot that can happen between now and this time uh, next year. And this could look quite different in 9, 10, 11 months. Well, Rick, when it comes to what is happening this week, as we look ahead to 2024, the GOP candidates are going to be taking the stage here for the third time, the third debate. It's set for Wednesday night when you take it's going to be less crowded the number of uh, candidates here obviously a dwindling just a bit Trump by far the leader but what are some of the key themes that you're going to be listening for as we look to who is going to be on stage on Wednesday I mean political analysts have sort of been mocking these debates as the uh, race for vi to be Trump's vice president or the undercard contest um, I, I don't know about that so I think one of the reasons that these uh, several candidates are still in it and why they want to stay in it as long as they can is what if Trump drops out? I mean, there's just a massive amount of uncertainty around Trump, especially with regard to the criminal trials uh, that I just mentioned um, that are going to get started next year. Um, I, don't, I don't know how many of those will actually be completed. I mean, this, some of them are scheduled to be underway well before the Republican convention next summer. Who knows if we're going to have a verdict, they could get delayed. But this is going to be a big factor in what happens next year. So Trump could drop out. Um, one interesting little wrinkle this week is the governor of Iowa has just endorsed not Donald Trump, uh, but Ron DeSantis, uh, the Florida governor. Uh, and uh, DeSantis and the former South Carolina governor, Nikki Haley, uh, they seem to be uh, running like two and three very close to each other. So Nikki Haley was up for a little while. DeSantis Maybe he'll have a little bit of a comeback. They are all miles behind Trump, but uh, who knows what is going to happen in 24? I mean, I, I, I don't think we've ever had so much uncertainty surrounding a, a presidential campaign as we have going into next year. So um, nobody will say that at the debate on Wednesday. They're not going to say, hey, the main reason I'm in it is because I'm hoping something happens to Trump. He goes to prison and um, that means I suddenly get a better shot. But I think that's why a lot of them are in it. It'll be a long 12 months ahead. All right, Rick Newman, as always, thanks. Bye, guys. We've got all your market action ahead live from the NASDAQ market site. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
The global push to go all electric remains elusive, even as the White House races to cut the number of gas-powered vehicles in half by the end of this decade. Electric vehicles have made progress, with sales accounting for roughly 14 percent of all cars sold in 2022, according to the IEA. Compare that to less than 5 percent back in 2020. Still, the lack of infrastructure charging stations has slowed that transition to clean cars. Concerns about charging availability top the list of reasons why Americans aren't buying EVs in a recent Yahoo Finance poll. Meanwhile, a recent PwC analysis showed the EV charging market needs to grow nearly tenfold in the coming years to keep up with EV demand. To address this issue, Israeli startup Electrion is working on a solution that could change how we think about the EV charging landscape, and they're deploying it in the U.S. soon. I traveled to Utah to get a sneak peek of the technology that could transform our roads. Electric vehicles have a problem. It's not price or styling, and it's not necessarily performance. What's really keeping EV drivers on the edge of their seats is range anxiety, the fear of running out of juice. A problem so big, the $8 billion charging industry is struggling to keep up. But a new technology called dynamic charging could change the entire charging dynamic. So how does it work? And what does dynamic charging mean for widespread EV adoption? I'm Akiko Fujita, and this is what's next for EV charging. Logan, Utah is at the center of a push to electrify America's roads. 90 minutes north of Salt Lake City, this tiny strip of land is testing what some have described as the holy grail for electric vehicles. We just came onto the track now. Now it's starting to charge from the coils in the ground, hitting with the receiver on the semi underneath. This truck is pulling power wirelessly through coils that are underneath this road. So you can charge as you drive. The technology hasn't been deployed publicly in the U.S., but it could be the future of EV charging. It's called dynamic charging. These squares developed by Israeli startup Electrion quite literally transforms roads into charging pads. The copper coils connected to the power grid are at the heart of Electrion's system. They communicate wirelessly through these receivers installed under the vehicle. These allow us to uh, directly feed into the battery and charge the vehicles. Would these batteries be smaller if it can charge more constantly? Absolutely, because right now you need a lot of batteries because we have range anxiety otherwise. If we constantly are charging, you don't need big batteries. It's a potential breakthrough for a market poised to quadruple by the end of this decade, according to PwC. EV chargers are expected to grow to a $30 billion industry by 2030. Assuming that market can achieve 50% EV penetration, this market will be upward of like $40 billion. Electrion's technology is all operated remotely through its software and servers. That means it can dial down the charge when and where the power grid is stretched and dial up the power when usage is at its lowest. How does dynamic charging lessen the load on the power grid. For the utility, what this means is they can have a flexible managed load as it's moving from one substation to the next substation. As a vehicle has a small battery on board, it doesn't really matter whether it charges in this mile or the next mile, but that could mean everything to the utility. The average EV can travel up to 300 miles on a single charge. In 2023, Electrion quadrupled that range on this test track by rigging an SUV with dynamic charging. They've already signed a partnership with Toyota to integrate the technology into new cars. The potential to charge on the go is a big deal, especially in a city like Los Angeles, the most electrified in America. Nearly a quarter of the cars are EVs here. There are roughly 15,000 public chargers for 1.6 million electric vehicles in all of the state of California. And as an EV driver myself, I've learned it's tough to find a reliable charge when you need it most. Chargers are expensive. 
They're often slow and they're hard to come by, especially for a majority of Americans who don't live in single family homes. Why are chargers so unreliable? Why do I have to go to five, yeah. six locations to just get a charge? It is very, very capital intensive. So for example, a 350 kilowatt charger can cost upwards of $250,000 and there is an installation cost as well. So economics are very, very challenging. Dynamic charging could help alleviate some of that demand, but it comes at a cost. $1.2 million per mile, to be exact. That could mean roughly $800 million just to install the coils on Los Angeles freeways. It's a cost that some countries are already shelling out. Sweden, Italy, Germany, and Israel are utilizing Electrion's technology. The U.S. is expected to be next in line with this road in Detroit. It'll be used to power shuttle buses with Electrion's technology. Those coils will be under the road on either side. So as that shuttle drives down this street from corner to corner, it'll be charging as it drives. Detroit is expanding its investment with plans to add dynamic charging to a three quarter mile stretch of Michigan Avenue in 2024. It's a big bet on the future of electric cars in the birthplace of American cars, with one of the big three, Ford, a partner in the pilot project. Congress is also betting on the technology with a bill to help fund future in-road charging projects. Dynamic charging isn't meant to replace chargers, but complement them. The technology will lead to smaller batteries, which could ultimately lower the costs of electric vehicles. It could also help utilities manage the power demands that come with electrification and ultimately eliminate range anxiety altogether. But there is a long road between exciting potential and mass adoption with plenty of challenges. If dynamic charging continues to gain traction though, the promise of a seamless EV experience could finally be within reach. Well, new developments such as dynamic charging already underway for EVs is opening a new avenue for the transition to electrification. So. How should investors look at the future of powering electric vehicles? Here to discuss is Stacey Noble at ICF Transportation Electrification Vice President, along with Craig Irwin, Roth Capital Partners Senior Research Analyst. Um, Stacey, I'm going to start with you because I know you have been looking at the challenges of the EV infrastructure for some time. As you look at a technology like dynamic charging, where does it fit into the overall infrastructure? No, it's a great question. And and like you said in the opening, the prospect of wireless charging, of dynamic charging is extremely exciting and one of the many innovations we're seeing out of the transportation electrification industry. You know, as far as it fits in, I, I would predict that the fleet applications are more likely to be the first movers toward the dynamic charging option. We saw a lot of shuttle buses, certainly some bigger vehicles as well. Um, so the, the opportunity for dynamic charging to serve those vehicles that are often you know, using the most electric miles potentially is, is pretty exciting and what we're likely to see move first. Craig, you obviously look at uh, this from an investment standpoint. You're looking at the EV side of things. You're looking at the charging companies as well. Um, why has it been so difficult to get this infrastructure going? And who do you think is best positioned right now? Wow. So um, infrastructure overall is actually starting to go reasonably well, right? There, there is still um, real cause for range anxiety. If you need to drive from A to B and you get to a charge station, it's down. It's never fun. Had the, that experience far too many times. Um, inductive charging as a technology actually um, is already working pretty well out there in the world. Um, the one uh, municipal fleet uh, uh, um, operator, Antelope Valley, uh, also based in Los Angeles, um, you know, has a fully uh, electrified fleet of municipal buses. They run, you know, using both um, legacy uh, cable charging as well as inductive charging on many of their longest routes. So it does work. Um, it is more expensive. Um, it is a little bit more difficult to implement, but there are a number of startups here uh, that are working. And, um, you know, it takes, it takes a lot of interest and a lot of innovation uh, across the spectrum of solutions. You know, don't think that these larger companies are not looking at this. You know, I wouldn't be surprised if maybe some of the uh, some of these companies were already uh, pretty well invested here. 
Yeah, Craig, you know, I, I've learned throughout the story in reporting this that this is a technology that could potentially really expand um, adoption, but at the same time, it, it's still in its infancy in terms of coming to market. So if you think about where things stand right now, is it really about DC fast charging that could really supercharge this move towards electrification? And if that's the case, what are those charging companies that are out there that you think really offer value in trying to expand the market? Well, you know, DC fast charging is just one piece of the market right now. Uh, the piece of the market uh, that seems to be working better is really level two. Um, DC fast charging has about $5 billion in federal funding from the infrastructure bill. It's slowly, very slowly finding its way into the market. Um, and that's maybe even having a little bit of a detrimental impact on short term uh, volumes. So, you know, longer term, this is the solution. If you want to drive from LA to New York, you got to do it with fast chargers. Um, the biggest companies there are obviously ABB um, and, um, and, and, and Tritium, I would say, are, are probably the, the two that, that investors can play with. You know, there, there are a number of other private ones in there. Um, and then, you know, the operators like Electrify America you know, are, are also very interesting because they, they provide a practical solution. EVgo as well, a leader there that's doing very well um, with DC fast charging for um, consumer vehicles predominantly. Stacey, so much of the research that ICF does is really looking ahead to, to where this landscape could look like 10 years, 20 years down the line, specifically on charging. What does that breakdown look like for you? Is it going to be about home charging? Is it about fast charging? Is it about technology like dynamic charging? H how do you see that breaking down? All, all of the things. <laughs> it really is an ecosystem approach for this. You think about where people keep their their vehicles, where they need to travel to. We have to have charging solutions at each of those locations as well as along the way. And it's not just about putting the chargers in the ground and having them available. It's, as we've said, they need to be reliably available. And that's a workforce development issue um, to be able to support not only the installation of the charging stations, but keeping them running, keeping the sites safe, lit, um, available. And, and, you know, again, we, as EV drivers, they need to have a similar experience as internal combustion engine drivers to be able to pull in and, and know that they can get a full tank, whether it's through gas or electricity. Um, but again, it needs to be kind of an all, or, all of the above solution and not just passenger vehicles, but as we've mentioned, the, the, the fleet applications as well. That's really um, significant promise looking ahead in terms of electrified miles. So having fleet depot charging, but also not all of these fleets return to base at the end of the day. So they need the same reliability along their routes as we do as, as passenger vehicle drivers. Uh, Craig, Tesla, the big name, of course, uh, competing in the EV space. We have seen a big move towards the standardization of the charging network with Tesla being the one that so many car makers have adopted, except for a select few. In terms of the charging network of the future, though, where does Tesla stand in all of that? Right now, we think of them as a car maker behind EVs with a very reliable charging system in place. But what are the opportunities you think Tesla can go for beyond just their current network? So, so what is missed on this whole Tesla NACS uh, um, expansion and then Tesla opening up the network to other to other vendors? Think about how annoyed someone that's going to buy a Tesla that goes to a Tesla supercharger station is going to be when they have a Hummer and a Leaf and all sorts of other vehicles online in front of them. That's number one, brand impact. Number two, if you're buying that Hummer or you're buying, you know, uh, the, the Chevy Lightning or whatever, right? If you're buying one of these other vehicles that many people find pretty compelling, uh, you're going to pay quite a lot more for electricity at a Tesla network than you would, you know, at another one of the independent networks or particularly more than a Tesla driver. So, you know, Tesla's going to have its place. Tesla is not everything. I think there's going to be a vibrant ecosystem of successful companies playing here. Um, and, you know, it's going to there's going to be some regional winners. There's going to be some international winners, you know, many in between. Some will be focused on selling electrons. Others will be selling hardware. Um, you know, it's it's a broad-based solution, and EVs are inevitable. It's not just Tesla that's going to win. Roth Capital's Craig Irwin, along with ICF's Stacey Noblet. Good to talk to both of you today. Really appreciate the time.
Thank you very much. All your markets action ahead, live from the NASDAQ market side. Stay tuned, you are watching Yahoo Finance. Twenty twenty three rocked the markets. Nvidia, the stock has been on a tear. Silicon this Valley week. banks collapse as the second largest bank failure in the U.S. Inflation, mortgage rates, a diabetes drug, exempting. Now it's time to make bold decisions. Yahoo Finance Invest, the marquee event for investors seeking big ideas and bold decisions. Guided by the newsroom you trust. Don't miss it, November 7th, exclusively on Yahoo Finance. Disney out with results this week, and ahead of the report, we're taking a closer look at some key discussions around the business, starting with ESPN. The sporting world goes. There aren't many brands as recognizable, yet the Disney-owned asset has emerged as something of a problem to solve for CEO Bob Iger. Despite the declining fortunes of linear broadcasting, Iger has made clear he's bullish on sports as a media property. Importantly, Disney revealed its financials for the segment for the first time in October. The move was partly seen as a strategic bid to generate interest around the unit with a view to creating some kind of investment partnership. Some of the commentary around ESPN is sounding bullish. Now, in a note last week, Bank of America Global Research said that the sports network could secure an enterprise value of $24 billion. But it added, quote, the benefit to prospective buyers appears nebulous. Don't forget this morning's announcement of a new CFO. It's also, it's all happening right now here for Disney. So where does the company, where does the story go next? We want to bring in Kevin Tran, the morning consult media and entertainment analyst. Kevin, it's great to see you. Lots to unpack here ahead of these results. Let's start with ESPN. We know that's going to be a focal point here in the earnings results later this week. How do you see or how should Disney, how can it solve its ESPN problem? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, with ESPN, 
previously Disney has talked about the challenges with um, linear TV in general, but sports as a whole still remains something of a valuable asset. Um, and there's been multiple buyers floated as uh, potential suitors for the ESPN asset. But I think that as long as Disney is able to lock down uh, valuable rights for ESPN moving forward, that will help um, you know, generate interest that could help Disney. So for example, we know that uh, ESPN has a broadcast deal uh, with the NBA and that rights deal is set to expire at the end of the 2024, 25 season. Um, that will be something very important for uh, Disney as well as other companies to um, try and lock down a portion of games for. Um, morning console research shows that NBA games are something that uniquely uh, appeals to Gen Z. So in July, 40% of Gen Z adults said that they had a favorite athlete in uh, the NBA, which our data showed was a share higher than that of any other major league uh, or sport. I mean, that, that makes it amazingly critical to retain those rights. How much more do you think it could cost Disney if they were able to do so? Yeah, rights increases are, are generally uh, something that's uh, anticipated, anticipated by the NBA and something that uh, is hoped for by the league as well as uh, um, league stakeholders. But I think that what's going to be interesting for these next round of uh, NBA rights negotiations is um, just how many more packages will be carved up. So uh, it's generally accepted or expected that during these next rounds of negotiations, um, the main broadcast partners uh, Warner Brothers uh, Discovery, as well as Disney, um, you know, may accept a, a smaller sliver of games uh, to be able to still be prudent with uh, the financial investment, um, you know, associated with locking down uh, live games. Um, and with those, uh, with potentially smaller packages going to uh, Warner Brothers, as well as Disney, that opens the door for a player uh, like an Amazon um, or another streaming player to carve out a, a streaming exclusive package um, in a way that we haven't seen previously. Kevin, I want to switch gears here a little bit and talk about the announcement this morning. The new CFO of Disney is going to be Hugh Johnson. He's coming to Disney after 34 years at PepsiCo. And I bring this up because Hugh Johnson was at PepsiCo when Nelson Peltz went on the offensive against PepsiCo, was able to fend off Nelson Peltz then. Now, when you take a look at what's happening at Disney now, where we're seeing the activist, activist investor pressure once again, obviously coming from Nelson Peltz. What do you think Hugh Johnson, who's now the CFO, will be the CFO? of Disney, how big of a help or what he's going to add here to reshaping the company's business? Yeah, I think that this will be a, an important move for Disney just in terms of um, continuing the, the road it's going down now in terms of being more prudent in terms of uh, certain investments like streaming. So across the landscape, of course, we all know that the focus now is um, not subscriber growth at all costs. Uh, we're really seeing companies like Disney um, put a increased uh, emphasis on being able to be, uh, you know, profitable as well as not overspend on content. And I think that, um, you know, with this new addition, uh, that is something we can look to uh, expect with um, the company moving forward. I mean, it comes right after the company had announced last week that it's acquiring the one third stake of Hulu that. Comcast is in control of. So uh, all that considered, how would you describe the perhaps cost discipline that you expect to be the, the overwhelming sentiment among the C-suite over the next year, 18 months, two years even for Disney? Yeah, I think that the uh, acquisition of the Hulu stake uh, is emblematic of the overall push of Disney to unify its streaming offerings and be able to offer uh, consumers streaming at an affordable price point. Um, so with locking down an asset like Hulu, it gains the ability to uh, potentially just be a bit more aggressive in, in bundling. So one of the theories previously why Hulu has remained a US only service is because, um, you know, taking that service internationally could be something that would uh, inevitably 
increase the overall price that Disney would have to pay Comcast for that remaining Hulu stake. So with uh, you know Disney announcing it will be getting full control of Hulu, um, that will be something that will help it bring Hulu more into the fold of its streaming assets, uh, and something that potentially could help consumers. Um, you know, access streaming on a, a more affordable budget as well. So, um, you know, there's been many price increases across the landscape this year. Uh, if you were to sign up for the Netflix premium plan, uh, the Hulu ad free plan and Amazon Prime, your monthly streaming bill would be over $50 already. Uh, and if you're somebody who likes streaming, it would be easy to rack up a streaming bill of over $80 monthly uh, by signing up to five or streaming services. So this is just something that consumers across the landscape are becoming more aware of. And I think that's why there's been more of a emphasis placed on password sharing and streamers like Netflix, as well as Disney, uh, bringing up the uh, issue of password sharing more recently. Um, so morning console data shows that in April, 23% of US adults said that they used a streaming password of someone that they don't live with. Um, which makes sense when you consider a lot of the high streaming prices that I just mm. uh, referenced. All right, Kevin Trey, we have to leave it there. Morning Consult Media and Entertainment Analyst. Again, we'll be getting Disney results after the bell on Wednesday. Well, Elon Musk's XAI has debuted its first technology in the form of a new AI chatbot, Grok. Now, the technology will rival OpenAI's ChatGPT and is intended to answer, quote, almost anything, along with having access to real-time data from X. This is all according to Elon Musk. Yahoo Finance's tech editor, Dan Halley, has the details for us. Dan. That's right, Sean. Uh, Elon Musk uh, unveiled this uh, XAI addition to the AI arms race, Grok. Uh, this past week, and he gave some hint as to, to what it has to offer. Uh, and apparently, it's supposed to be a kind of snarkier version uh, of an AI chatbot than we've seen before. He says that it's modeled after the uh, Hitchhiker's Guide from the Galaxy, the book from the, uh, or the, the uh, guidebook from the book of the same name, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. It's also uh, supposed to be a little more irreverent. Uh, use real time data from X, so it'll be uh, up to date. It's not gonna be trained, it's trained uh, on, on older data as well, but it's not going to rely solely on older data. It'll be able to pull in something uh, that you know re recently happened. Um, and it really seems to be as though they're trying to make this as efficient, efficient as possible, cutting down on the amount of power that it requires uh, and the amount of training that it needs. Uh, according to the, the site, XAI, uh, they've managed to surpass the capabilities with their Grok 1. Uh, this is the second generation or second iteration of Grok. The first was Grok 0. Uh, it surpasses the capabilities of uh, GPT 3.5, uh, as well as Inflection 1, which are two other uh, chatbots or, or AI uh, models. So uh, obviously, they're making some progress here. It's not, not uh, up to snuff when it comes to GPT-4 or uh, Claude 2, uh, uh, excuse me, Claude 2, uh, but it is seemingly doing very well so far. Uh, these are some of the folks that uh, were from Google DeepMind, uh, obviously Tesla and SpaceX, uh, among others. Uh, and so it's really kind of got a murderer's row of developers and, and you know, obviously thought leaders in the AI space. I think now what's going to happen is, uh, you know, there's plans to charge for this, make it part of the X. Uh, premium subscription service. Uh, but where do we go from here with something like this? Does it wrap itself into X? Uh, does it become a, a new type of product? Uh, is it something that you know uh, X will actually make money off of? Obviously, running these kinds of models is very expensive and can uh, be a drain for a while. So we'll just have to see where, where Elon Musk decides to go from here. We will see. We'll be tracking all of this. All right, Dan Halley, great stuff. Thanks so much. Let's do a quick check of the markets just about an hour into the trading day. We're still looking at gains across the board. Stocks coming off what was a very strong week last week. We're seeing the Dow still push just a bit higher, up just above the flat line, up about 30 points. We have the S&P also in positive territory. The Nasdaq, the leader among the three, up just about two-tenths of a percent. When you take a look at the sector action this morning, healthcare, consumer staples, and technology leading today's trading action. And taking a look at the 10-year yield, we've been placing so much emphasis, rightly so, on the movements that we're seeing in the bond market, while well, the 10-year yield moving to the upside today at 462. Tomorrow, you can tune in for Yahoo Finance's Invest 
Summit. We've got some huge names ready to discuss the most pressing issues in the investment landscape today. 